Um, all right, welcome uh, everyone to the DDPS seminar today. Uh, before we introduce our invited speaker, let's go over some rules and logistics. First of all, please mute yourself during the talk unless you have questions. If you have questions, you are welcome to unmute and ask. Otherwise, please use chat room to post your questions so that we can address them in Q&A session at the end. Second, today's DDPS seminar is open to external audiences, uh, so no classified discussion is allowed, so please watch out. Finally, the talk today will be recorded and uploaded in our YouTube channel. Uh, that's about it. Now let me introduce our speaker today. Okay, it is an honor to host Dirk Hartman, uh, who is an industrial mathematician at uh, Siemens Tech um, and uh, the Siemens Technical Fellow, uh, entrepreneur, and thought leader in the field of solution and digital twins. Among many uh, distinctions, he received the prestigious uh, Warner Von Siemens Top Innovator Award for his lifetime achievements and the Siemens Inventor of the Year 2021. Multiple of his innovations have led to novel products and services have been showcased at top level innovation events, as well as have been covered by external media. In his career, Dirk uh, took several leading roles in research innovation and development across Siemens, including the lead of a multi-million Siemens R&D program and the technical leadership uh, for the simulation and digital twins field at Siemens technology with more than 120 scientists across the globe. He's a passionate mentor, teacher, and supervisor for the next generation of innovators and experts exploring novel digital twin solutions for all industries. Today, he will talk about machine learning and physics-based simulations, in and yang of industrial digital twins, which is a very interesting topic. So please enjoy his wonderful talk. Now, without further ado, let me pass the button to Dirk by asking one random question, as, as, as we usually do. Today's random question is, what is your favorite things to do other than research? Well, you know, typically I always say this is my hobby and that's my favorite thing to do. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I guess my next favorite thing is, is really yeah. my, my family and my four kids. Um, oh, you have a four kids. Enjoy. Yes, I do. So that's kind, kind of you know, the two things: uh, mathematics, uh, the research around, and my family. Oh, well, we um, have things common. I have a four kids too. Okay, oh. great. <laughs> all right, it's all yours, Dirk. Okay, so, you know, so thanks a lot for 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 the very very nice um, in introduction. Um, and and you, you mentioned I, I I enjoy very much until try trying to do that right now at, at Siemens. You know working a lot together with the younger, younger generation students, whether it's master students, PhD students. Um, so that's why really this this is, is a summary of all my you know, students, collaborators, working with them on these topics. Uh, you see at the bottom mainly the uh, Technical University of Munich, as well as the uh, University of, of Magdeburg. Um, the focus of, of my talk will be, well, as, as written machine learning and, and physics-based simulations. But I would really like to take here an industrial point of view, so, so take an application point of view, rather than going very, very deep uh, into the individual mathematical models. And my ambition is, is really you know, trying to spur a little bit of research, getting into a discussion exchange um, to, to really drive here, here the mathematics or computational science and engineering research, because I think that, that really has to play a very pivotal role when it comes to you know, future industry applications. Also, a small disclaimer, um, it's, it's written there machine learning, but for most of parts of the talks, uh, I'll really use data-driven and machine learning synonymously, so it will not only be all neural network, but also good old classical polynomials, um, etc. Good. Um, the structure of, of the talk is a little bit, well, wh why digital twins? You know, um, obviously, as you can, can see from the slides, I'm, I'm working at Siemens. Why, why is Siemens uh, so excited about digital twins? Then a very, very short deep dive on digital twins. Don't want to spend too much on that and, and then really go to the core topic, machine learning and physics-based simulations. 
So why digital twins and, and why digital twins at, at Siemens? Um, you know, Siemens has changed its portfolio over the past years quite, quite a lot. And, um, you know, if you would ask now anyone at, at Siemens, what is really our mission, um, our vision, that's all about combining the real and, and the digital world. And we do that, you know, for, for customers in, in all the different verticals, uh, areas from, you know, from food and beverage uh, to, to pulp and paper or life sciences and really support them on, on their digital transformation and sustainability journey and challenges. If you speak about you know, digital and, and the real world um, and, and connecting that, then at the heart of that, that is really the digital twin, the comprehensive digital twin. So the digital representation of, of real world assets um, to be in or to, to be used as replica of the real world, sufficiently accurate, uh, tightly connected, so that it can do you know lots of what if scenarios. Um, et cetera, and really support decision-making in the end. So that is, is kind of, of the usual story I always tell speaking about Siemens, um, but this time I have to add something. So um, we, we really try now to push these these days um, to, to the limits and actually, um, you know, it's, it's not only about connecting the real and the digital world, but a key ingredient here is also the industrial metaverse. And yesterday, um, Siemens and NVIDIA announced really a partnership and we try to reach for something bigger or nothing smaller than really trying to transform the manufacturing industry and really bringing together these high-end physics models as, as uh, we provide them at Siemens um, together with really the, these interactive um, virtual walls and AI technologies. But but enough of, of advertisements. So what is digital twins? Um, typically, you know, I, I start with a rather lengthy introduction, uh, trying to provide the details. But actually, our communication department uh, did did quite a great job, and they have a very very nice explainer on digital twins. And I rather would you know refer you afterwards, going to to the YouTube channel of Siemens of just follow the links or, or the QR code and, and, and watch that, that three minutes uh, introductionary video. Um, so for the moment, you know, I, I would just describe it as we would like to have digital replicas you know, accepted as full substitutes for the reality, which we can use to do decision making. So always having in mind a, a clear purpose, would like to predict how a system behaves, and then out of these predictions, you know, do decisions for, for real world assets. Um, why am I excited or why, why is now you know, the time to speak about digital twins? I mean, digital models and all this, it's, it's not a new story, it's, it's rather old. The main reason is, is it's really the technology uh, which has evolved so much so that this now becomes really possible on an industrial scale. Um, if you look at the data, the compute power, the connectivity, which is the basic ingredient for the digital twins, I mean, that, that's all there these days, probably even have too much data. Uh, we have the complete infrastructure, so, so cloud, HPC clusters, uh, user experience, you know, fast networks to, to really run these computations. Um, also, the algorithms themselves, you know, whether it's AI, machine learning, uh, or physics algorithms, um, are on a level really that, that it, we, we can go the next steps, bring that into applications. And on the other hand, there's lots of applications really requiring digital twins um, in order to be successful. And then you know, my famous example or my favorite example is always 3D printing. All of a sudden you have these super complex shapes you can produce, but, but the challenge is how do you design them? So um, that that's, you know, the digital, digital or the applications basically need the digital twins to, to go the next steps. And here really hard of all that, it's, it's computing power, AI machine learning and mass physics based models. And that's what, what I'll be talking um, the next 30 to 40 minutes about. Um, also put here some, some, some examples, but, but I'll jump over that and rather look a little bit or speak a little bit about, you know, why do we need machine learning in it at all? And to many people I, I, I speak, uh, in particular those from, from the computational science and engineering, it's all about, well, you know, digital twins, isn't that just modeling and simulation technologies we have you know, since, since ages? Um, 
why why is it relevant um, to at all look into novel technologies? And the key thing is we might have all these nice technologies, but it's really bound by our expert resources, the efforts these expert needs, and it's not really the technology. So that just the time for many of these you know, applications to get to an appropriate model, to get to, to a fast enough model uh, to connect all those different software landscapes, that's really a key blocking factor. And what you could see here is, is a survey I did a couple of well, months or probably a year ago on LinkedIn, really trying to figure out or, or highlighting what are the bottlenecks as really not the compute power or whatever, it's really this effort of experts to build models and, and connect the different uh, software landscape. And that is really what we need from an industrial point of view, new tools so, so that we can do that at scale and are not any more expert bound. And here, I really, really believe that, that bringing together the machine learning on the one hand side, so, so leveraging the data, the observations we have these days abundantly, as well as our simulation models and fuse them to really come towards digital twins. Um, for the talk today, I'll focus um, more or to a large extent really on the simulation models and how we could use machine learning to accelerate um, the predictions to get closer to real time and less about informing uh, simulation models from data. Um, to, to do that, I'd like to, to, to take as a guiding principle kind of um, well, what I would call here mathematical architecture of, of predictive models. So, so you know, how does, does a classical model-based approach with a numerical solver in, in the background look like? Well, we have a model that, that you know, the model goes into a solver, the solver you know, does a prediction, next time step goes back to the model, and you have this circle of um, you know, the equations and the mathematical solver in the background doing the prediction. Um, then, of course, the model, that's why I put here system model, typically have you know, different sub-models. And if it's a 3D you know, multi physics or 3D physics problem like computational fluid dynamics, discretization also comes, comes into play. And then you have lots of different input data that's on the one hand side, you know, boundary conditions, but on the other hand, which is also quite important, really, you know, numerical parameter, time step sizes, uh, et cetera. And last but least, very often that is built really into an optimization loop um, to support that decision making and optimization I would also see here in, in the general case really model predictive controllers. And now if looking at that, there's many, many different you know, opportunities, use cases where we could use really machine learning to accelerate these the different steps to, to, to make the different steps less expert bounds to get to the right models, uh, to get to the right settings, etc. Um, and it really all starts at simple use cases like, like the input data. You know, finding the right numerical parameters you need to set for your simulation. I mean, that, that depends typically on experience. You know, what, what is the right, the optimal time step size to put into, the, the right mesh size, et cetera. How long will the simulation run? Will it converge at all with these parameters? That's something where we could use machine learning to support well, the expert or the non-expert trying to run that simulation. Um, on the discretization side, uh, when we do you know, discretization of continuum equations for, for multi-physics com computations, machine learning can, use, can, can be used to, to, to support you, the engineer, to do that automatically, to come up with optimal grids. Um, speaking about the models, yeah, we, we very often have or might have quite, quite accurate models. We also understand the models, but then to get an abstraction or you know, a higher scale model, which we could put into a system context and which is fast enough is missing. Again, here, machine learning can help to derive those models. Um, if you'd like to have fast, well, responsive models, um, response surface models, um, packaging basically the, the whole solver and, and just you know take the input parameters, predict the prediction, again, machine learning can help. Um, even going down into the single solver steps, we can use machine learning to accelerate that solver um, just to get faster to the same result. And last but least, another use case uh, when we go to the optimization, say, case or challenge is, is you know, can we do those things explainable um, to understand really what, what machine learning is does. Um, what I like to 
do today. And then I see, see there's always quite quite a number of questions. Um, I think I'll, I'll get back to, to them later in the talk or rather at the end. Um, pick out here three use cases um, where, where you know, I, together with, with the people um, I mentioned up front, worked on and tried to you know, deep dive a little bit, uh, highlighting what is opportunities and challenges, and also trying to, to give feedback or, or from, from my point of view, what is working and what, what are more successful approaches and what are not, not that successful approaches. And also taking here a little bit um, a personal historical perspective. So, so really taking you a little bit with, with my journey into this machine learning field. Um, so, so it really all started a couple of years ago when I looked into optimal mesh refinement and how can, can machine learning help there. So um, put put the goal quite quite simple. We'd like to have you know fast prediction of of designs in in virtual wind tunnels. So a CFD simulation. In that case a two D CFD simulation. We just put an object in the wind tunnel. I would like to get that prediction as fast as possible with an optimal accuracy. Well, and then of course the question is what what is a good mesh? How do you distribute optimally the degrees of freedom? And uh, now you, you might answer. Well, that, that's, that problem is solved. There is something like goal-oriented error estimators uh, you can use to drive your adaptive mesh refinement. And yes, that is true. But the big challenge is in order to go this way, uh, you really need um, a joint solvers, which is not available in all commercial software tools. Uh, you know, you need an expert knowing how to drive those or set up these solvers. So in a way that that's limited. And the question was, can you learn that with machine learning. And what we did here really is we took the very, very big data approach to, to get there and then to look into that. Um, so we started uh, with, uh, well, it's, it's all 2D, uh, one inflow con condition, but different geometries. And we did quite a number of simulation, simulations or better calculations of optimal meshes using, well, dual weighted error estimators, so goal oriented. In that case, I think the goal was uh, predict the lift as accurate as possible. I did a number of, of simulations here on the, on the SuperMock. Um, given then those, those optimal meshes, uh, we put on top, well, um, we put on top um, image processing. So, so in the end, the idea was, can we use you know, neural networks, communicational neural networks from the image community um, to kind of predict at least not the mesh structures, but optimal mesh densities, and then feed that into a mesher. And in order to do that, um, we, we used here a commercial tool. You know, also here, the, the students spend lots of time in developing optimal scheduling algorithms uh, so that we really could, could exploit um, that, the, the supercomputer here, the SuperMOOC. Um, and then in the end, as I said that you know, using standard technologies, convolutional neural networks, uh, we then tried, you know, given a new unknown geometry and optimal mesh density distribution you could then put into a mesher. Um, and why I said big data approach and why you know we all had these optimal schedulings, the super mock, et cetera, is, is because we really did here 60,000 2D wind tunnel simulations using a commercial CFD code because we wanted to see you know how far far can we go. Um, as said, the, the idea is you have a geometry um, and for this geometry we would like to predict an optimal mesh density, feed that mesh density then into a mesher. Well, let me see what I got here. Um, feed that then in, into to a mesher and um, solve it then, then by a commercial code. And the idea is that, that, you know, replacing the first two steps by a machine learning solution so that this can be really used, this density as an input in any kind of simulation tool, even if it does not have a joint capabilities or, you know, any type of goal oriented um, meshing support. Uh, as said, the um, neural network architecture we use pretty standard here from image analyst analytics uh, staircase unit architecture with skip connections um, and roughly um, 10 million, um, well, actually uh, close, close to 100 million, um, no, yeah, 100 million degrees, degrees of freedom. Um, so that has been kind kind of the setup. So it's a rather large you know, network, rather large data, and uh, well, the good answer is you know after sufficient number of of training steps, so 300 epochs, uh, we get to to a quite well uh, accuracy. 
uh, on the validation set um, close close to 99%, uh, or well, thought, okay, that, that's sufficient for us. By the way, um, because we spoke here about 60,000 simulations, so a large part went, went of, of the project went also into to think how could we generate appropriate geometry so we could really use to generate the meshes and, and the training, because obviously, um, you know, cannot generate 60,000 ge uh, geometries manually. Um, well, what, what does it mean? 99% accuracy, that, that's something quite, quite hard um, to get a gut feeling for. So let's look really at, at numerical experiments. And what's shown here is two numerical experiments. You see on the left-hand side, um, if you would have given the, the, the geometry to the measure of, of the tool, um, uh, the, the kind of error estimates um, after you have an optimal mesh, and then the same on the right hand side, uh, you know, working with the mesh density as predicted here uh, by our uh, neural network. And you see that actually the neural network does, does a quite decent job um, in terms of, of uh, the quality of the mesh and the accuracy of the prediction. Uh, what it does not do, do, do a good job is really if we go beyond that viewport, so I haven't mentioned uh, yet, but we really focus this mesh density estimation for a certain part only of the geometry. And uh, well, obviously the wake, et cetera, is then not sufficiently refined. Um, so that's why, why all these quality measures, we really focus here on the viewport. Um, so, so you could say uh, quite, quite successful first experiment um, going, going this way. Um, bring together neural networks with with um, solvers. Uh, you know, we, we we developed a tool where you can get optimal goal oriented mesh generation for for any measure. Um, it has an accuracy of close to ninety nine percent. And what's very nice with this technology, and that that's why we really went uh, as as a first use case also for mesh generation. It requires no validation, yeah? and if, if you have a wrong prediction, it does not affect you know any validation procedure. Well, in the worst case, you just have slow computation times. Well, was it a success story? I personally would say not, uh, because we really require twenty thousand simulations to get to that accuracy for a single wind tunnel configuration, and only two D. Yeah, that already spent sixty years of compute time on a supercluster. And anyway, that, that's nothing feasible if you would like to go to 3D multiple inflow speeds, et, et cetera. And the, the key learning, and why I'm also sharing this is this example, and I think it's it's very important to, to make also people aware is that these brute forces or big data approaches will likely not work for many engineering applications. Yeah? Also, when, when I you know, often talk to, to engineers, they see you know um, the DAL-E example, for example, what you could do, do there with generative things, the alpha fold, the alpha code, et cetera. Uh, alpha go is another example. But that is really data sizes uh, which are very, very hard to generate on an engineering level. So that's why I'm trying to advocate whatever we do here. Uh, you know, we, we should put in more intelligence and really try to fuse much, much better um, the simulation or, or modeling technologies as well as the machine learning, not taking this, you know, generate lots of data and run a neural network on it. Um, so that's why my, my next focus is, is on the model identification. Um, so instead of you know, trying to learn the relationship between input data and the prediction, let's focus on a single part of the model. Yeah? Not, not even the identification of the complete system model, but just of a subset of, of that system model, because that is actually something um, you know, what we might generate data, it's the model is, is well known, quite, quite con confined. We might even, you know, generate data from, from um, small scale simulation and try to learn that. And that would be already enormous value. Uh, the use case um, we, we, we worked on here is uh, coming from the chemical industry, and that is cooling of a multi-tubular reactor. Um, so the reactor is consisting of lots of tubes, and those tubes, a reaction has taken place, and you would like to control the temperature in those tubes and in order to do that you have a coolant um, flowing around those tubes and you 
changing the flow rates, etc. You can then indirectly control uh, the, the temperature distributions in those tubes. But of course, if you'd like to do that, um, with all the uncertainties around, etc., cetera, um, you really need real-time prediction of, of those complex uh, cooling flows. And, and that, in the end, goes really to, to what, what's well known as, as model order reduction, um, with, with the ambition to, to reuse these reduced order models in, in, in the larger setting. Um, so so the, that, that's why I you know, would, would say that that's kind of combination of model identification and, and model order reduction, because we identify the model based on um, high fidelity simulations. I think the, the process is very well known, so, so I'll, I'll jump jump over that. You had Benjamin Piersdorfer also here speaking about what, what he's doing. So you know, generate lots of snapshots. Also, you know, many of you are working on that. Identify um, you know, the, 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 the low dimensional manifold you'd like to, to train your reduced order model onto. Find then the, the time stepping operators, and uh, well, the end is, is the reduced order model, and there's lots of different ways, you know, Looking into that, um, ourselves did, did quite a lot of the neural networks, but I'd like to get back to, to the operator inference because I think um, that that's a very, very nice approach and also highlighting you know, the strengths if, if you not use neural networks, but try to go back to simple linear or quadratic relationships uh, because I, I strongly believe that, that you know, as long as we're not in high dimensions when really the power of neural networks kicks in in low dimensionals you know polynomials it sh should be probably tried always first um and and in particular on the engineering side you know so many of our models are based on taylor series so, so whenever we learn something we, we we should go maybe with that polynomial spirit um well also it's a glass box box approach so we have kind kind of some some insight but then you know trying those things out well, there's quite some challenges. You need quite good exact estimates of the time derivatives, and there are some magic stabilization parameters in there. So the question we, we posed here, you know, can, can we do that better? Again, taking some technologies from, from, you know, explored in other fields of machine learning and bringing that into the concept of operator inference. Um, in order to explain a little bit what, what we did, let me quickly uh, review the classical operator inference. Uh, so the classical operator inference, basically what it does, you look at, you know, well, for, first of all, you reduce or uh, do, do a, most cases a POD, uh, principal component analysis, to project your high dimensional data and your low dimensional data. You try in this low dimensional data, estimate the time derivatives on the one hand side, and then you try to identify a, a model predicting those time uh, derivatives and minimize uh, the difference between them. So that means in each of the time steps, you basically try to get what the time derivative predicts and what the um, what the model predicts uh, to to get that as minimal as possible. And then on top, you need some some regularization. Um, and that's really a step here, focusing on on the individual time steps. And I think that that's really the key thing. So we try at each time step to minimize the diff difference and not to look at the whole trajectory. Um, that really requires us, because we look at each time step, having these good time um, uh, estimates of the time derivatives, uh, stabilization very often challenging to tune. And last but not least, um, the regression doesn't work well in, in many cases and is not really optimal. Um, so, so because we like very much the concept of this polynomial approach, um, of this explicit approach, we, we, we you know, we, we, our ambition was to, to look for, for different um, opportunities, technologies, how to do that. And um, was at that time when, when, you know, the neuro ODE paper got quite some attention um, later, you know, being described as differentiable, uh, machine learning differentiable solvers. So that is kind of the spirit we wanted to put into here. Um, so the key idea is instead of you know, taking each individual time step, trying to minimize uh, the residual there between the observed time derivative and the time derivative predicted by the model, we say, okay, in the end, we're not interested in time derivative, but we're interested in trajectories. So let us minimize the trajectories under the constraint, of course, that one trajectory is the observed one and the other trajectory is predicted by the model. Um, 
that's actually classical um, constraint optimization. Um, as that minimizing that, and then there is lots of different technologies in order to do that. Um, you can either say, okay, that requires to solve an additional, however you call that, from, from which community you are, dual joint problem, the KKT system, or from a machine learning perspective, you know, just write the solver and uh, in the loss function and differentiate to the solver through an auto differentiation approach uh, to using a JAX framework or something, or Julia or something similar. And um, what we actually did here is because the system is so simple, we, we solved the KK or set up the KKT system ourselves um, and really solved the forward and, and the backward problem to do the training. And what can be seen very nicely here is here's a comparison of, of that operator inference on the left hand side where we use the classical ones, you know, minimizing the residuals on each time step and on the right hand side, really minimizing the complete trajectories. There's still this peak in, in the middle. Um, but the peak is because uh, the training data we, we, we looked at or the set of, of, of applications we looked and that was always at the middle of the time, a switch in the heating behavior. And so that's why which, which is not appropriately cap captured the dynamics there. So that's why there is still this local error peak. What we can nicely see is that really using this differential approach, um, you know, not only don't we need any magic stabilization parameters, et cetera, but we get also a much nicer regression of the problem and all these issues you know also with getting the right time uh, estimators of time derivative is not there and is a much much more stable approach um, from an industrial point point of view um so again i i, I would say you know spirit of these neural old neuro odes or um you know differentiable solvers combined uh, with the idea to use the same optimization technique techniques on polynomials um you might also argue well that's basically a kind of optimal control where you try to tune your parameters of the polynomials um so, so that you meet the observed trajectory could could be another point of view because in the end all this is, is just basic very classical constraint optimization um so so the nice result here is uh, the, the the two predictions here for, for the one of the validation cases are basically indistinguishable um on the top it is the uh, 3d physics uh, with, with a commercial cfd solver and 400 000 degrees of freedom and at the bottom it's really an explicit and that that's a very nice thing ode with eight degrees of freedom uh, so you can really write it down uh, and this, you know, writing that down explicitly is also very important. Having in mind, we'd like to reuse that in a different tool. Not all tools, I mean, it's slowly changing support that you can, you know, hand over a neural network uh, to be integrated there. If you speak about control applications, would like to implement something like this, you know, directly on a controller, then also neural networks is, is really an option. So that's why here, um, you know, this, this more polynomial approach is, is really a, a very nice way to do it. Um, I think the key benefit is really could could accelerate here by orders of magnitude uh, the speed. We have that explicit form, and um, what I would like to highlight this differential solver technology is so really tightly differentiating or integrating the solver in the optimization approach uh, is something we one one should basically consider in any um, machine learning approach if possible. A drawback is it, it requires, of course, some solver in, intrusiveness. Um, and if, you know, if, if the solver does not really provide joint capabilities, then then it's challenging um, to to drive these these approaches. Um, of course, you can always you know rewrite a solver, but uh, from from industrial perspective, you of course would like to do that in a solver uh, you'll you'll be also using at the end. Um, and the main learning case or point I wanted to make here is. Uh, not always go straightly with 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 uh, the high dimensional approximators, but but also sometimes consider to have simple function approximators, um, because in the end uh, Taylor expansions, which we you know daily use in engineering, is in the end polynomials. Um, I would like to close a little bit um, the the presentation was with a very very early topic. Um, we, we're working in, in into looking into and that that's really you know the ambition can can we accelerate solvers by means of machine learning um 
Well, the goal is obvious. We'd like to have fast computational prediction of unknown flows. So, so we would like to use that to do prediction without extensive training data generation. Um, so the challenge is really to do that agnostic to specific geometries or specific models. And also would like to do, and that's an issue I have very often, you know, looking at, at similar approaches, um, we don't really want to reinvent solver technology. We want to improve the most efficient solvers available and also benchmark ourselves with the most efficient CFD solvers available. Um, doing that, well, the most efficient solver technology we have for CFD these days is geometric multigrid solvers. Um, for those of you who are not aware of that, uh, if the Gauss algorithm is, is if your matrix is n times n, so n and numbers of unknown is n to the power of three in complexity, iterative sparse solvers is n to the power of two, geometric multigrid solvers is really linear in the, in the amount of unknown. So that's why, why you know, this is really optimal solver technology. And um, the key idea where, where this relies on, and that's actually quite, quite important to understand um, the, the next steps, so that's why I'm doing this, this small, small, um, you know, deep dive here is what I show here is the result of a very simple 2D, uh, 2D diffusion equation. Uh, it is random initial parameters or a random initialization and using an iterative solver. And um, so after, you know, having not done a, uh, an iteration, the error is, is quite randomly distributed, but then if you do, three iterations with a simple iterative Jacobi solver, you smooth out those high frequency errors. Uh, so so it, you still have low frequency errors, but you've smoothed out the high frequency errors. And that, that's the basic concept uh, one uses in, in the geometric multigrid solver. So the key idea is you smooth out on, on a fine grid the high frequency errors and then project the solution to a much coarser grid and then what was you know, low frequency errors on the, the fine grid turns out to be high frequency errors on the coarser grid. And then you repeat that uh, procedure um, all the way down if, if you're to a level which you can solve it with a direct solver and then you go back and that's uh, here called a V cycle. So there's many, many other cycles how you can do that, but that's the basic idea. Um, now, now our approach here was, uh, okay, let's assume we have that, that multigrid solver, it's, it's already efficient. What we actually would like to do in, in a spirit of a multi or super resolution scheme, can we use that or can we use neural networks to go one level finer and, and do a prediction on, on, on a much finer level? And then also not only to have the flow visualized on, on that level, but also take that newly generated information back into to the solution scheme because obviously that then um, very much influences uh, the, the further evolution of the flow. So that's that's kind kind of, of the approach we, we've taken here, um, you know, using a neural network to, to go one level or multiple levels deeper, more accurate in, in a super resolution fashion. And the key advantage here of um, the uh, geometric multigram solvers is that the smoothing is, is a local scheme. Yeah? So we interact only, or all the operators interact only locally. Um, and that, that means that, that we would like to train this, this uh, solution here. Um, so, so we solve up to a level L, use the uh, deep neural network to correct that solution and then you know, take that information from the correction back to the level L, do the next solve step, uh, etc. But if you'd like to train that, um, we train really on each patch. Uh, so, so we really train on each patch of, 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 of the uh, computational grid, which means a simulation is not only a single data set, but a simulation consists obviously of you know, many different of these patches so that all of a sudden a simulation is not one data point, but depending on the size of the simulation, you know, thousands, tens of thousands of, of data points. And that really solves this issue of how to generate appropriate data. Um, and, and that is, is really a key here um, and, and very much different to, to the first approach that I've shown. All of a sudden, this data generation gets simple. And uh, the hope is also because it only looks at local properties, um, extrapolation will be much, much better um, than, than training the whole thing. Uh, what you can see here is, is a first results. Um, of, of, of you know, the standard single cylinder in, in, in a flow uh, problem. 
Um, at the very top uh, on, on the right hand side is the simulation with um, L plus one level. Um, actually, I think L was here four or five. I'm not really remembering correctly. Um, at the bottom is the prediction on a, on a causal level. So that means L. And in the middle is the, the correction of the L uh, using the neural network. And one can clearly see here that uh, using the neural network, we, we are much, much more accurate um, than just staying on the level L. Um, of course, the next question is what price do we need to, to pay? And that, that's shown here. Um, so on the top is, is the fine multigrid. Uh, at one line beneath is, is the uh, multigrid with a level L. And here you can see nicely the, the linear complexity also in terms of, of the computation roughly. And then uh, we have uh, that plus the correction uh, using the neural network. Um, well, we only get a factor of two here, but but we only go one level up, and and you know our, our expectation is that that we really like to try to push this further to the extreme, so at least to get a order of magnitude, so to so really go a couple of levels up, uh, in, in in the next steps. Um, also, you know, looking at pictures is one thing. You can also then compare that with uh, the drag and the lift, and what you nicely see here. Um, if you go up one level or even two level with this approach, um, you, you accurately or more accurately cover the drag as well as the lift. And so far, what I've shown you here is all trained for the single cylinder problem. I made the bold statement or the bold claim, well, how well does this generalize? And so we took exactly that, that data we generated up front and took that to, to different applications. Uh, um, first, you know, flows without a cylinder. Um, so that's uh, the flow around around uh, a corner in a channel. Um, and uh, a simple channel flow, you can see that on the simple channel flow, we don't do that well. Yeah, we, we're a little bit off. We lose the symmetry um, here here at the bottom part. Um, but, but on the left hand side, I mean, actually still quite good having in mind, you know, we haven't trained it on, on, on that data. It doesn't really destroy anything. Uh, but then if we go one one step below, um, you know, we, we even can can do things, and, and that's probably interesting when we look at the drag at, at the lift rather on, on the left hand side on the figures, improve predictions for the case with two cylinders. And that's something you know not even well, not even close is probably wrong, but but the training hasn't seen only the one cylinder flow and not not the two cylinder flow. And having this this um, you know local um training. And, and you know the global information is still capped and, and calculated through the solver. Uh, we we can see it nice or nicely. Well, well, it generalizes better. I think it's still still some work to be done here. Um, but but we are we are quite quite surprised uh, how well the system did. Uh, you know, not having trained it there. So kind of conclusion for, for this uh, solve solver uh, acceleration, I think this is local patchwise approach, the super resolution really trying to deeply integrate the solver as well as the machine learning is a way to overcome this data issue. And I think it's also similar to the spirit really um, of, of the example before for the model order reduction, really try to embrace the solver in, in, the, in the training or in the machine learning model is, is key. Um, then this local structure, uh, this local training, of course, makes makes generalization much much easier, yeah, because these local features you have many of those uh, in, in in the flow. Uh, and and last but least, uh, here we worked only on the solver, so so that you know allows to build or extend classically well proven solver technology. Um, and even if that is is you know only as initial guesses, maybe. Uh, for for an iterative solver and accelerate there, so so that you know the last step you can still go with your well validated and certified solver technology. Um, so far that that's you know only first steps, only a mild improvement, only one or two level up. Um, what we haven't done here completely. So 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 far it's all residual based, um, not really differentiated to the through the solver. I think there there's you know lots of opportunities um, for for future research. Um, Main message from my point here is, is really, I think, deeply integrating machine learning and a solver technology is, is the future. And um, well, there's many, many more interesting use cases. Happy to, to provide uh, you know, 
some some pointers to to work we've done there in the past um just just let me know um let me quickly break up before we come, come to questions uh, i i really think you know not only what what we do at siemens but in general uh whether it's the iot the internet of things whether it's the metaverse it, it's really a you know a new age a very uh, great great time being being a computational scientist um, because all these technologies will require much, much more um, novel predictive technologies. Uh, and and the, the, the solvers will have completely different requirements than to the solvers we've, we've seen before. Um, you know, they, they will be used um, autonomously by, by non-experts. They will be, you know, looked at having much, much faster response times. They, they should calibrate automatically to data if, if used during parallel, uh, parallel to the op operations um so complete different requirements and that in the end then uh, you know leads really to to lots of different um research questions um and and not only on on the computational side so that, that that's something which which is quite quite important for me personally because i think also on, on you know looking at the user how can we you know guide the user provide different experience um is is really a key thing here uh where, where research could could support and drive novel industrial applications. Um, and then hopefully, and with this, I'd like, like to close, you know, get really to, to, to these impressive results, also in industrial applications, what, what we see um, on, on the you know, pure machine learning side, on, on, on the generative algorithms for, for art, et cetera. And, and here the picture I, I just took, I, I could not resist playing around with a DALI 2. Um, and it's quite, quite, quite impressive. Yes, you just give it text and it comes up with these nice, um, paintings or, or whatever photographs, visualizations, and that's kind of uh, what, what I would love to see. You know, uh, the combination of machine learning and and uh, simulations in in the future. But at the same time, I think it's it's still a long way to get to that level. Good. All right. Thank you so much for the wonderful talk, Dirk. Um, I enjoyed it a lot. Okay, let's get into the. Uh, Q and A session. We do have a uh, many questions uh, in the chat room. Uh, let's start from. Let's trace back. What is the first one? Uh, the first one is uh, from Pat. Um, in your definition, must digital twins be induced from data, or can they instead be created manually by humans, or is induction simply a more effective approach to build them so well for, first of all i try to be away from definitions of digital twins <laughs> and and rather it's you know take 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 a philosophical approach so, so what we really would like to have in the end is is a, is a reliable sufficiently accurate digital counterpart of of, of the real world asset um, and, and whatever technology helps us to to get to that effectively is 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 the right technology. Um, obviously, you know today it's it's mostly created manually by by humans, um, but that is also the, the the key limitation of of that technology because we we simply don't have enough experts, and so that's why I think you know in being induced from data reusing knowledge like like we've seen from the from the uh, reduced order models um has has a big big opportunity uh but but i would not say you know must the the one or the other uh we it, it's all about which which serves the the application we have in mind in the end all right sounds good um okay the next question is from rob hayes uh, he asked what i cannot see from this explanation is why an analytic model with some stochastic uncertainty folded in will not be as good as or better than the digital twins. Can you clarify? Um, I think well, he yes. was pointing at specific slides in the beginning. Well, may maybe I can, can quickly comment on, on, on that. So first of all, you know, a specific analytical model with stochastic uncertainty in it um, is a great digital twin. Um, the key challenge will be how to get to, to that analytical model, um, which is sufficiently accurate and, and sufficiently fast. 
if we do have that model, yeah, well, then by all means use use that model. Um, if we don't have it, and very often, you know, the energy conservation, mass conservation, momentum conservation, all that that's well known, but very often we struggle with closure models. Uh, where, where very often we, we we struggle to to uplift the model um, to to a more macroscopic scale where we where, where it's fast enough to to calculate. And if we don't have the models, then here that's really where I think the machine learning combination with the data models can can help. But as you know, if we have an analytical model with stochastic uncertainty um, or even without stochastics uh, uncertainty quantification in there, you know, then then we should definitely go with that analytical model. I mean, the, the way analytical model is derived is, um, is from data in some, for some, to some extent. Ah, okay, so, so, so sorry, I, I thought that, well, then, then also if, if, if you do have, you know, the data model and that, that works, yes, then, then you should go with, with the data model. But then, you know, for data models, you need more and more data, but if you have that, that data, then you should, should do that. If you don't have it, try to enrich it with, with uh, physics knowledge. So same same arguments holds there. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um. The next question is, I, I don't know if this is a question or not, but the, by uh, Octa Octavi, um, he he commented that uh, usually don't analytical models have many assumptions of the system incorporated. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Of course. Maybe. And and that 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 is, is is I guess also very much the strength, yeah, because you could see on on the CFD side we haven't trained it for for some of the situations, um. But but because it has you know all this this knowledge integrated, it at least didn't do harm, yeah. We 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 didn't get get worse predictions, um, than than the solve on on the level L. All right, let's move on to the next question. Next question is by. Pat again, um, does it have to be a neural network or would induced governing equation and parameters stated in traditional form? He's already answered that, I think. It, I mean, I, I, I asked that when it sounded like he was going to be one of those neural network fanatics. And I think he's, he's, <laughs> and he's clearly, clearly much broader than that. So thank you. All right. Sounds good. Uh, maybe next question is also answered. Like, why would you use arbitrary polynomials rather than uh, define a space of uh, physically plausible equations based on domain knowledge? Um, if, if, first of all, I like that neural network fanatic <laughs> expression. Um, well, I guess, guess again, the the answer here is is, is the same. If if we do have if you do have the expert available with, with the domain knowledge, then then you should always go go with that. And, and really, all this I would only advocate for if if you don't have that domain knowledge. All right, sounds good. Okay, next question is by John. Um, he has two questions. Uh, can a digital twin also learn the model from sensor data during a training? period of time rather than from solving PDEs itself. Um, so generally speaking, can you talk more about the connection between sensor data and the digital twins? Um, yeah, I mean, in, in, in the ideal case, of course, um, you know, we, we, we should use as much sensor data as, as possible. Um, however, you know, many of the applications I have worked in, in the past and, and looked at, um, there is not that much sensor data available. And because typically, as, as, as discussed, you know, doing a digital twin, doing, doing those analytical models is, is rather costly. So um, we, we typically go first for, for applications to look at where you don't have abundantly data, you could, could immediately train training neural network or, or any other machine learning. Um, process, but rather try to go for the cases where there is sparse data and still try to combine that then um, to, to do some predictions. Um, so, so obviously when, when we use sensor data in those applications, and another example I've, I've shown, not shown here because I think I talk too often about that, is at least uh, checking for plausible, for calibration of, of, of the model we do have. Um, as well as for checking plausibility, um, estimating errors. So that's typically uh, where, where we use the sensor data, but not really for training or learning a model. Okay. Okay. 
next question and, is, and the, 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 maybe to right. just make this point that the reason is simply um if, if there is abundantly data etc then, then you probably would not need all this you know more sophisticated effort to do, do things in a simple machine learning based model would, would do the job like a Gaussian process okay uh the next question um from Pat again, uh, your examples have focused on PDE models that have a strong spatial aspect, but I have seen other work on digital twins that focused on complex but non-spatial models, some with ODEs and some closer to discrete event models. Do you uh, count those as digital twins as well? Yes, of, of course, I, I would count, count those as, as digital twins as, as well. The main reason I have pre, pre you know, strong focus here and whatever I presented on 3D physics is uh, first of all because I have a you know 3D background so that, that's what I did most 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 of my life and the, the second nice argument also is I mean three data always have strong correlations and that makes of course things like model order reduction much easier than than if you go with uh, you know more complex systems Okay, so the path also, um, you know, nicely at least is some relevance, uh, the work uh, on the chat. So everyone is welcome to check that. And the next question is by uh, Pylins. What do you think are the most difficult or technical challenges you encountered in, in applying deep learning for learning surrogate models? I guess your personal ex experience. Well, my, 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 my personal experience <laughs> is um, I have so far not really used deep learning, really. Um, and, and, and the main reason is deep learning. I mean, except the first example I, I, I've shown about, about the grid refinement, which, which is, of course, deep learning, is that deep learning means, you know, lots of neurons, lots of degrees of freedom means lots of data and and for most of the, these applications we, we we simply have not the data or cannot afford to generate that that data so that's why why also you know trying to put a focus on if possible use polynomials well sometimes it might make sense to to you know go go, go with neural networks because if they give you a much much bigger freedom in terms of, of the functional space in the background um then of course neural networks, but but it's always rather shallow ones than the super big deep learning models. Okay. Uh, next question from Pat again. Uh, complex models that involve long casual change will propagate uncertainty so that uh, final predictions have wide error bounds. Do you causal. know of any? Causal change. Uh... Causal change. Okay. Do you know of any general response to this challenge? This will arise less in PDE models of spatial systems than in ODE uh, models of non-spatial ones. Well, uh, hard, hard to uh, to to answer here because I don't have too much experience. And um, but but I guess this is is the reason why I favor also so much um, these approaches where you have you know the differentiable solver or or you know neuro odes uh, however you call it uh, constraint optimization because it really looks at the trajectory and the trajectory includes the information how errors are propagated yeah? whereas if you just look at individual re residuals you're, you're losing that that information yeah let me let me clarify the question um uh, it's Imagine that you have data on components of a complex system, and you uh, and you uh, you use induction to build models of those components, but you don't have data on the overall system. And now you want to put them together uh, to make predictions about about what's going to happen in the overall system. Uh, there's going to be the individual models will be will be have errors, and those errors will get propagated, and that's going to be a big issue because if the errors are enough if their propagation is large enough then the bounds on on the predictions are going to be useless now i know that the in the neural net community there's this idea of of maybe you can train components but then you train the entire system right end to end you could do that if you have the data but often you you, you may not you may only have data on the component systems and so 
I, I believe this is a big challenge. I didn't think that you had an answer because I don't know that there is an answer. I just think that it's a, it's a point worth raising in the context of the goal of building robust, accurate digital twins. Yep, I, I, I com completely agree. And then as I said, my, my, my hope and, and because is, is really to think a little bit in, into this directions of, of those differentiable solvers. So trying to, to take in a way into account how that would be solved in, in, in a bigger solver. Thank, thank you. All right. Um, next question is by George. Um, how do you manage to deploy your machine learning uh, models out of the Siemens commercial softwares? For example, star CCM. What procedure do you mainly follow? For instance, solve the simulation, extract the results and prepare machine learning models. Uh, what's your opinion regarding physics informed neural network, uh, so called the pins and the ROMs to combine them with your already developed methodologies? Um, so on the StarCM Plus side, um, there, there is, uh, well, how, uh, mostly we use it and the, the results you've seen, the, the grid refinement uh, as, as well as the multitubular reactor is, is we use that as a data generation engine. Um, <clears throat> Maybe more more in terms of, of future perspective, but but cannot really talk talk in detail there there about things and, and time timelines etc. Is of course I mean Star Sim Plus is is one of of the few commercial codes um, which which comes with a joint solution capability. Yeah? So so this this intrusive methods um, are are basically supported by by the solver structures through through the joint capabilities so, so there i think that there is lots of opportunities to, to go also into those more intrusive mechanisms um roms i think i i spoke a little bit about uh, because the, the the second case um is is a reduced order model um on, on the pin side um If you, if you refer to, to the very, very original paper of PINs, I think there, there's lots of, of debates uh, around it. Um, a short answer may, maybe is um, it, they, they introduce physics as a regularizer, and that is the way how PINs should be used. You know? Use PINs when you have data and you need regularization of that data because you you're simply have not enough data. Um, Using pins as solvers, as 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 sometimes promoted, is is really, from my point of view, not not the way to go. Um, quick answer is uh, first first of all, you, you you train on complete time domains, you lose the the notion of time. Um, you you have no control over your function spaces. Um, you're not using optimal solver technologies, so, so we'll be having a hard time being compared to state of the art solvers. And that's that's really what I'm missing. And I would also encourage everybody, you know, listening to 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 to, to the presentation today, you know, whenever you come up with these machine learning technologies, please try to benchmark them with state of the art solvers and not just, you know, with a standard uh, iterative sparse matrix solver or whatever, um, or, or even a direct solver. Um, because then it, it, it's really hard, uh, you know, if you'd like to, to evaluate later on the capability, uh, you, you renew to do the, the evaluations again. And um, yeah, something I'm, I, I'd like to push, haven't yet found the time, is really also from, from the community provide open data sets where you really say, okay, this is state of the art solvers, high end solver technology. Really try to benchmark your results with these high end computations. Um, and not with just some random open source tool, not, not really meant to be a high-end computing tool. Okay, um, next question is by uh, Raja. Could you comment on extreme or anomalous event uh, prediction in connection with your talk? I guess he's- Well, yeah, I'm- Funny science. Uh, I, I, I guess, uh, you know, much, much of, of the stuff we, we, we do is, is really having the anomalous anomalous event prediction in mind. Huh? Um, so, so we'd like to do root cause analysis at least. Yeah? If, if, if the data we, we start to observe has nothing to do with the data before, um, then, then using this, this, this you know, model-based approach, we could, could 
at least trace the, the, the strange behavior back to a single component or whatever, and, and give at least indications, look, this component is starting to show weir or whatever, um, and then, you know, give feedback to, to the operator of that system, you know, do you need to do an emergency shutdown or can you run that probably and then get a feeling how, how that, that uh, you know, weir will evolve, how much time you have to, to do. Uh, what we, of course, not do and not looked really into is, is can, can we really do, uh, you know, quantification of likelihoods of extreme events when it comes to validation and certification, because I think, uh, to go in, in, in this direction, it, it's still a very long way for, for machine learning. Okay. Um, next question uh, from Quan Chun. Um, whether a digital twin comes from stochastic PDEs, statistical machine learning, or deep learning on observed data, or some combination alternate, how should the digital twins be updated or recalibrated against its analog twins? Well, I think the, the, the most important thing is it, it, it should be updated uh, or, or, or recalibrated uh, because, I mean, if, if you would like to mimic the real world, then, and then it should be always up, up to date and the machines are subject to, to weir or whatever. That means also, you know, if you have a larger system, you update the motor to a different class, and of course, you also would need to update uh, your, your whole system model. How to do that? Um, well, as said, in, in the end, it's a calibration, optimization, new learning task. I think the bigger challenge is really here on, on the um, industry processes you, you, you have in place, yeah? your product lifecycle management tools, et cetera. How do you then efficiently deploy a new, new, new twin um, if, if that's running on the edge as part of the control, et cetera. Uh, so I think it, it's probably a little bit less the, the, the issue of, of, of uh, really the um, calibration learning uh, technologies. All right, sounds good. Okay, the next question is by uh, Dinesh. Um, he asked, does the DNN multigrid approach have potential for achieving real-time predictions like a pure ML model? Um, fast enough. D d d depends on what is is real time prediction. Yeah. Um, so I think if, if you really try to aim for real time okay. prediction, and then let me take take uh, one one of the extreme most extreme case I've I've worked on is a prediction of the deformation of of a robot to to increase its accuracy, and there real time means a prediction every millisecond. Um, a guaranteed prediction every millisecond, eh? and that, that's something. Yeah, uh, well, a machine learning model might 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 be able to do, but but nothing like like this um, neural network multigrid approach. Um, the big strengths of of the multigrid approach is is acceleration on on the one hand side, and then the other big thing is is the generalization capability. Yeah, this will work even if it sees. A geometry it has not seen before. Yeah, I mean you could, could just do a bend in in your channel and then remove the, the the cylinder or put a second cylinder into it, and you still get reliable predictions. Pure ML model would not be able to do that. And I think that that's really the the strengths of of that approach, um, and not really targeted at at real time. Sounds good. Okay, next question by Palin. What do you think are the gaps between some standard PDE benchmark, for example, flow through the cylinder or some other 2D PDEs and practical digital twins problems, for example, scalability, more complex or heterogeneous scenario or any other aspects? Um. So I think, think the, the, the standard benchmark problems um, one, one has um, are, are very important because it, it you know it, it, it is a good set of, of, of problems capturing the relevant aspects of, of most solvers and their capabilities. Um, so I would not really see the issue of having more benchmarks, but as I said before, I, I would rather see an issue of you know not only 
describing the benchmark in terms of, okay, Navier Stokes, and this is geometry, but also in particular for the machine learning community, you know, provide things with, with pre-computed uh, solutions so that they could take the solutions directly, compare with the solutions, um, provide timings uh, of, of those two solutions, uh, provide information how that scales with, with increasing the number of grid points, etc. cetera. Um, so, so to really have relevant quantitative KPIs one could benchmark or compare the machine learning solutions with because far too often from my point of view that that's just the inorm matrix. Okay, uh, thank you, Dirk. Um, I guess we reached the last question. It's by Octavi, and he wants some more explanation about your DNN MG uh, method. He was uh, somewhat confused uh, how it works and uh, etc. Um, well, the, the the key idea is is just on on your finest level or you know multiple final fine level. You just cut them out on on your multi is scale um uh, on, on your multigrid thing and um you know instead of doing the, the the prolongation restriction and smoothing to to the finer levels respect to the smoothing on the finer levels uh, you would just replace those you know prolongation restriction steps uh with with the machine learning with approach the um, and that would not do any smoothing in between i see okay thank you so and from your results uh you show that this is faster than yeah. Multigrid only in the finest um, level. Yeah. Okay. Great. And and also it is uh, for me the key point of of the of the talk, which is com very interesting. Like, congrats. This is great work. Uh, the key point is that um, it's it's transferable to un uh, completely unseen fluid cases, like the the, the corner case. You trained with yeah. flow, flow around a solid body, and the same model can can predict accurate very accurately on, on an unseen uh, case, so. Well, I, 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 I would not say necessarily very accurately. Yeah. I mean, you, you do not get the nice accuracy as, as, as uh, for, for the case where it has been trained. So, so for the moment, I would rather take a more conservative statement. At least it doesn't get worse. Yeah? Whereas if you do a machine learning, yeah. you have no control. Uh, and it might might bring you into a completely different region and then, then it starts to make harm. Yeah, at this case, at least didn't does doesn't make the solution worse. Yeah, great. And, and so why why do you think that happens? Because it, do you think it's learning more the local structures so it can uh, generalize better? I think it's 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 really um so I've I've spent lots of, of my previous research uh, and time in in multi-scale modeling. And also also if you if you look at flows and our our, our flow models uh, what we have on the turbulence side, it's it's all multi-scale things, yeah? and really finding the the right closure models, etc., for those multi-scale effects, and and that's in the end all very very local. And I think really this local multi-scale nature is 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 the key what what is exploited and why why this method works that nicely. And and the good thing is, and that's why I like to work with with fluids, is is you know that that the turbulence community has shown there is something which can be learned. Um, which generalizes nicely, um, so so that's more or less you can also say re rediscovering uh, by by machine learning approach what what any engineers working turbulence anyhow might know. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Great, great work. All right, sounds good. Uh, one additional question by uh, Dinesh: Are you also working on multi-scale physics informed ML machine learning? Um. Yeah, I, I mean that that's uh, basically um, I said the the, uh, the CFD case is a little bit bit uh, exaggerated here. You could already consider as as multi-scale, but but I think multi-scale um, is is an important point point of view um, where, where machine learning can play really a very very big role. And and yes, we're we're working on that. You know, identifying the right closure models when when you do multi-physics that could be turbulence. Um, that could be porous media flows, uh, whatever. Sounds good. All right. I think we you you hammered all the, all the questions. I mean, I I think this was the talk with the most questions ever so far, which I have hosted in the past. 
and we pass like the um, like the 15 minutes uh, after the designation some time. Thank you so much, Dirk, for the wonderful talk and then uh, wonderful Q and A sessions, and and especially given the situation that you are in Europe and late evening right now for you and spending the time with us and that was great especially thank also, you for you also thank you very much from my side for for organizing this yes I, I benefited a lot from this and so the least i could do is is to give something back with with a talk it's, it's oh, a great series awesome awesome mutual mutual beneficial yeah <laughs> All right, sounds good. Thank you so much. Okay, that concludes the talk today. Uh, let me uh, stop the.